Well, hello everyone. Good evening. I'm so happy to see you all here tonight and a good evening to everyone joining us here on the live stream. It is an honor and a pleasure to welcome Brianna Thomas, the author of Black Broadway in Washington, D.C. to Bus Boys and Boards tonight. Our history here at Bus Boys starts on U Street and we, we understand what it means to be on Greater U Street. The black history, the community, just all of it is right here in the nation's capital, but people don't seem to remember that anymore, especially now as rising rates of gentrification, um, just overall violence against black communities is making DC look radically different than it used to be. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Brianna and we can learn a lot more. Thank you guys. Black owned, um, black fund 
funded. And from the 300 businesses to date, there are only three remaining from the Black Girl Alma area. Does anybody know what those three are? And if you're watching online, you can name them in the comment section. I named one of them already. Bitch Chili Bowl, exactly. <laughs> You're listening. Bitch Chili Bowl um, and Dutch of Lake. Is it Lee's Flower Shop? Lee's Flower, yes, that's one of them. Lee's Flower and Car Shop is one of them. And also Industrial Savings Bank, which is the first black bank in DC. And so those are the three left that are still within the um, same family that founded them black home from the Black Broadway here. But that's a big, big gap, right? And so after my uh, Article published, a publisher saw it online um, after the ring and print did online, and they said, Hey, you should write a book. And my publisher's Arcadia, and now I have a book. So that was five years ago, and now the book is out. So it's been a lot of research and a lot of studying and interviewing. You'll see the back of my book says, uh, The Voices of U Street. And I really wanted to make sure that I told the story of U Street um, from the perspective of the people that live there. I think that it's one thing to tell it from an academic standpoint, a reporter standpoint, right, because my background is journalism. But it's totally different to tell it from the actual voices of the people that live there, grew up there, and helped build what we now know as a wonderful neighborhood and area. So that's something that I really sought out to do, and I know that my, it helps my project stand out. So let's get into the good stuff, right? <laughs> so I always like to start by reading um, this quote. And it is actually by Richard Lee, who is the second generation owner. Um, right now, his, his daughters are actually the ones running this flower and car shop. But he has the perfect way of describing what Black Broadway was. And he says this, everybody knew everybody. We didn't miss going downtown. We didn't give a stuff. I mean, excuse my language, but they wanted to have all that stuff to themselves? Fine. We had all this stuff to ourselves. Now, Lee's Flower and Car Shop is still there today, like I mentioned. Um, it's been open since 1945, and you can see it. Um, it's right on U Street. And actually, I'll tell you about my last walking tour when I'm at, in this presentation. And you can go see it. Um, so that was the actual pride, right, of U Street, that everybody knew everybody. It was a tight-knit community. And something that Richard Lee said was, you know, they had their stuff. That was okay. Now that's a very interesting um, sphere or, or idea to have as a person of color during Jim Crow laws, during segregation. And that's exactly how U Street was formed to be a thriving black neighborhood. Because in other parts of town, even downtown, um, if you're a woman of color, you couldn't go into a department store and try on a hat. But you can come to U Street and you can shop, you can party, you can work, you know, you can own a home, you can open up your own business, but just in the surrounding areas, not just the segregation that we think of like in the deep south, right? But there was segregation right here in DC. My book actually begins, and I'm gonna read a little a little bit of it um, in a moment too, but I, I realized I've done several talks and never read the first page of my book. <laughs> so I said today I want to do it. Um, but DC um, is established in 1791 as the nation's capital, but it's situated between two slaveholding states, which is, of course, Maryland and Virginia. And so DC becomes a very big slave market. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Well, that's how people of color initially were here, and out of being free from slavery, they um, went through contraband camps, and when you read my, my book, you'll see more of that, but they begin to make their own and have their own. So they formed the neighborhood right on U Street. But I said all that to say that although there's glory days of U Street, there's also the real history of how black people started to have their own. And I think that sometimes gets overlooked. But I'm going to start, and I'm going to read page one of my book since I had it. <laughs> and it sets right at this place of um, slavery, but really DC emancipation, which is special for DC, and I'll we'll see in a second. Marching through the nation's capital on the afternoon of April 19, 18 were as many as 5,000 African Americans overwhelmed with joy and pride. Cheering along the streets were slaves who once coffled, jailed, and traded. A celebration of freedom had been long overdue. Four years before, 3,100 slaves had been freed by President Abraham Lincoln's D.C. Emancipation Act. 
marking a day of triumph, and for me, a reflection of hardship. With blue skies, a well-dressed procession, 10,000 black spectators, music, flowers, and banners reading Lincoln the Liberator, the first annual District of Columbia Emancipation Day Parade commemorated the abolishment of slavery. But the years leading up to the end of bondage in Washington were far from celebratory. By 1800, slaves in Washington outnumbered free people by five to one. And so I wanted to read that and kind of um, give you the full picture of, I'm going to go back to the fun part of Black Broadway, but it's important that we know how Black Broadway began. Um, just how Black Broadway was formed because Black people could not do their own elsewhere. And so we did what we always do. We make really sweet lemonade out of very, very sour lemons. And we picked ourselves up and we created our own. And it started from this place of being free and emancipated. Now, the DC Emancipation actually takes place place a few months before the actual Emancipation Proclamation, which frees slaves everywhere. But D.C., we were the first free. And that um, character, in fact, and that achievement of being first transitions into Black Broadway. So when you think about Black Broadway, you immediately usually think of the theater and the lights. And when you hear Broadway, what place do you think of specifically? New York. New York, exactly, exactly. And so that is really how Black Broadway got its name. It's referring to the theater district, which we all know very well, known as Broadway. But there's a word before the Broadway, and it's Black. Because U Street was a place of livelihood, it was a place of entertainment. You had the Republic Theater, you had the Howard Theater, Dunbar Theater, you had all of these jazz clubs. Um, the, what we would know in this generation as Bohemian Caverns was formerly known as Crystal Caverns. You had all of these uh, dance halls and different places where you could party and have a good time. And so um, Pearl, Bailey, Pearl Bailey, who grew up in D.C., and she was a performer, of course. She's um, noted for coining the term Black Broadway um, because she said that it was just like New York's Broadway except for Black. And that was special because of segregation and Jim Crow laws, a lot of artists could not play in other theaters and other clubs, but on U Street they could. Um, before there was a Harlem Renaissance, a lot of people don't know that there was a DC Renaissance. So before the famous Apollo Theater opened up in New York, um, actually the Howard Theater had already opened in 1910. And what makes Howard Theater so special is it was a place that was very diverse, although it brought in a lot of um, um, they even had circuses at the Howard Theater, you can imagine that. <laughs> and there were so many bricks there. Actually, Pearl Bailey got her start at Howard Theater as a Howard Act. She was a high stepper um, and a performer there. But what made it special was a quarter of the audience was made up of white people. And so you had this place where people of all colors could come together and can have a good time and can celebrate just being alive. That's unique when you're thinking about the air and the time that I'm referring to in the early 1900s. And so this pride and this, uh, this uh, livelihood was very special, but it was also funded by something, and that's black wealth and black money. So in my book, I really take the time to feature the entrepreneurship that was in Black Broadway. I know a lot of times we just want to hear the jazz part. Of course, Duke Ellington grew up on U Street, and he, uh, you can You'll see his house where he lived in Shaw to this very day, actually two homes. Um, and we like to talk about that part, which is great. I have all of it in my book. But I didn't want to skip the fact that, you know, going to theaters and clubs were free, right? Black people had to pay to party. So that means that we had money. We had jobs. We had our own in a lot of different clubs and places, which was unique to, in comparison to somewhere like New York, they were also black owned. And so, um, one of the big parts that I mentioned at the very start was Industrial Savings Bank. So Industrial Savings Bank was the first black bank in D.C. And this is special because in order to have your own business, you need what? Money. <laughs> exactly. You need money in order to own your own home. You need money. You need loans. And because there was a bank right on U right Street that was black owned, a lot of people were able to buy businesses. They were able to buy their own and their own property, which they could not do in other parts of the town. Um, not just because uh, there's their color of skin, and also, too, even if you had enough money, white banks could turn you away, or they would give you crazy 
crazy interest rates. It was very unfair, but on U Street, because of a place like Industrial Savings Bank, which is still here today, black people were able to have their own. And so what did they do? They built more and more and more and more. And so another thing that wasn't just the black wealth of U Street that's special to know, it's also the black education. And so um, I want to read a piece of Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton um, forward. Because she actually uh, graduated from Dunbar High School. And Dunbar High School, of course, is very special to U Street um, and the corridor itself. It is the, fir the first high school in the nation to admit black students, which is huge. When you say it now in 2021, it's like, oh, that's not a big deal. Like, no, that's a huge deal that right here in the U Street corridor, we have the first high school to admit black students everywhere in America. Um, it started, it was formerly known as Intro High School, and then um, before that, it was actually founded in the basement of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church, which is still around today. And so Congresswoman Norton, she talks about in her forward how, um, similar to Richard Lee, how the spirit of being inferior to white people was not a thing on the street. Um, because of the education, because of the, the black wealth, because of the entrepreneurship, Black people already grew up with this sense of pride of knowing that they were special and that they could make impact. And clearly it worked for her because she's still out fighting for statehood. She's been a top civil rights activist for decades now. So it's an honor to have her in my book. And I'll tell you that story after I read this. <laughs> so she wrote this at the end. The segregation that guaranteed limited contact with whites left blacks in the district outside of the daily and immediate psychology of inferiority. The African-American community itself managed to provide protective insulation from the notion that segregation equaled inferiority. The district left me well prepared to go away to college and to law school to participate in the student, student nonviolent coordinating committee, which is known as SNCC, and to begin a life of working against segregation and for equality. Sheltered from feelings of inferiority by our African-American community, fueled by a focus on education and embraced by our own segregated community, centered on U Street, everything seemed possible. And that was the real spirit, rhythm, and heart of U Street, that everything really was possible. And um, it's something that she said that I mentioned before that stuck out was it became somewhat of a enclave or a safe haven for black people to be able to create. And so one of the uh, creators, I like to call them U Street heroes that I like to feature um, also too because we talked about wealth and business. We talked about uh, the nightlife a little bit and we talked about education and a really big educator was uh, the man who was known as the father, the man who killed Jim Crow. And his name is Charles Hamilton Houston. Um, a lot of times we hear about his mentee, which was Thurgood Marshall, and Thurgood Marshall was actually trained by Charles Hamilton Houston, and Thurgood Marshall was famous for doing what? Anyone know? The, I, I hear a little bit. But he's famous, no, um, yes, the judge, yes. But then also, even before then, he won the case for Brown versus Board of Education. Okay, he said, you look at that. In 1954, he won the case for Brown versus Board of Education. Hello, hi, Granny. This is my grandmother, everyone. We're matching. You can wear purple. This is purple. Oh, the so Charles Hamilton Houston, he was known as being this really resilient lawyer. And so he grew up on U Street. He actually was a uh, student and a teacher at M Street High School. He went on to, uh, he was in the military. He was one of the first uh, blacks that were able to serve in the military. And while he was stationed in Fort Lee, Maryland, he faced a lot of racism. And he faced a lot of discrimination and harsh treatment. And this was a shock to him because on U Street, he didn't have to encounter that on a daily basis. So when he went away to serve his country is when he was treated the worst. Now, that sounds really bad, but it's the truth. So because of that, he, when he left the military, he came back to U Street, he taught a little bit, and then he went, um, went on to law school, then he went to Howard University, and he revamped the program. And the reason being is because he said the only way for us to truly fight back is we're going to have to fight back through the legal system. He had encountered um, so, such harsh treatment 
and realize that black people didn't have a voice when it came to justice. Um, some of the statistics of the lawyers back in the day in the early 1900s, there were about 153,000 or so white lawyers in comparison to only about 1,200 black lawyers in the nation. So when you think about committing a crime, well, who's going to defend you? Up against all of these other lawyers, it was a very small ratio, and a lot of the lawyers at the time, they had never even been in a courtroom. They had never even practiced, and so they didn't have the experience. And so what Charles Hamilton Houston did, teaming up with Mordecai Johnson, who was the first black president of Howard University, and he came in, he got funding, he was able to get some um, pick Howard University up so it could be accredited and things like that, and he revamped the program. So what he did was he brought in a lot of intellectuals and leaders to Hugh Street and to the university specifically, and one of those, as I mentioned already, was Sir the Marshall. And so this is special because Howard University, which is founded in 1867, of course, is still around today. <laughs> now I'm looking up in the corner. Um, it's still around today. And what made this special is it attracted a lot of brains to the area. It attracted a lot of stars to the area as well. Um, Howard University was a huge social hub. In my book, I, I talk about how it was referred to as the Black Mecca. And so because of the founding of this university, a lot of people were able to not just be educated, but also they were able to start sororities and fraternities and benevolent societies and all these different book clubs and parades. Um, one of the biggest things that Howard University used to host is like a homecoming was something called the Capital Classic Parades. And uh, one of Lee's Flower and Car Shop used to support them with flowers for it. And so it really was a center to be this black mecca, but it was because of the new uh, educators like Charles Hamilton Houston and a few others that helped revamp the program. Another new true hero who actually came from graduating from Howard University is Dr. Charles Drew. Now, does anyone know what he's famous for? No? He is the first, um, well, not the first, he's the one that invented um, the first blood bank. So, blood transfusion. I'm saying, okay, yay! Yeah. <laughs> he's credited for that, but he was a student of Howard University, which is also very, very cool to see how he first took place because of Howard and how they took those talents onto U Street. So Hill Street High School, which is now known as Dunbar High School, was famous for a very long time for producing the top um, students and scholars because they literally would have people with doctorates teaching high school courses because they would be trained at Howard University and couldn't teach anywhere else as a person of color, so they took their talents to Hill Street High School. One of these teachers is Carter G. Woodson. Now, Carter G. Woodson is known for founding what? You got it. Black history. Yes, he's a he's the that's what he's credited for. So he um, started the Journal of Negro History and published first in 1926. He was a teacher at Industry High School. He also had his own office um, on U Street where he would journal history. He used to he trained a lot of other um, people. He actually had Zero No Hurston as a student at one point. He was a famous folklorist. Um, and what he did was he created Negro History Week. And now today, we know that it is federally known um, as Black History Month. So it used to be a week and now it's a month. But we also know one thing, Black History is not just a month, it's every single day. <laughs> Which is why I wrote this book. And so those are just some of the U Street heroes. One more that I'll mention, and then I'll open it up eventually for questions as well, is Mary Church Terrell. And so Mary Church Terrell, she's one of the women of U Street that really made a big difference. Um, she was a top educator. She was a, a vocalist. She was a really proud activist in speaking up against racism. And she was one of the founding members of the NAACP, which a lot of people don't know because you think it was all founded by men. But no, Mary Church Terrell was actually one of the founding members. One of the other things that she did was she lived in the Joy Park, which is still there, still there today, and you can actually visit her house, but she also fought for um, housing equality as well. Because she was a fair skin, she was able to get in different rooms and different places that um, women that were of darker skin weren't able to, but she used her voice um, to her advantage and she made a lot of change. So her husband was Robert Terrell, who was the first black federal judge, and so uh, you 
kind of time traveled back to these streets. They would be the Beyonce and Jay Z of the time. I mean, <laughs> they were really the power couple. Like you wanted to be around them. They were gorgeous. You think they were literally, like I said, they were Beyonce and Jay Z. And so you can still visit their house today. And also, she also founded her own association, the National Association for Color Women. And so I'll mention one more woman. Is that shot? Um, but maybe Helen Merrill, so of course, is um, very special with DC. We even have a street named after her. But I mentioned a little bit about um, how Mary Church Soil was more fair skin. Well, maybe Helen Merrill was of a uh, darker skin tone. And because of this, she wouldn't, even though she was just as educated and just as vocal as someone as Mary Church Soil, she wasn't offered the same opportunities. And she spoke out and began to write works on something called colorism. Now, of course, nowadays, that's the term we're familiar with, especially as um, black people. But what colorism is, is this something within our actual community where we discriminate and are prejudiced against one another because of the shades of our skin, which makes no actual sense. And then Nancy Helen Burroughs was completely against that. She spoke out against bleaching um, your skin as an African-American woman and straightening your hair. She really wanted people to embrace the skin they were born in. And so she opened up her own school for women and girls because she can remember not being accepted. And so she opened up the National Training School for Women. It was on 50th Street. And she was one of the new street heroes who I always like to know. And so we talked about the activism. We talked about the education. We talked about even uh, the church a little bit, which was the backbone of the community. I mentioned how the very first school was founded in the basement of 15th Street Presbyterian Church. And of course, the church was really a place of activism as well. There were a lot of uh, preachers who would preach about freedom in the pulpit. The pulpit was their, was their courtroom, if you will, and their place where they could make change. And you'll read all of that in my book. And the last part I want to talk about is the community. Um, the community of U Street was very tight-knit. It was very special. And it was a place where you could mix and mingle with everyone, no matter your social status or class. Um, something that was very interesting to me in my research was the Lincoln Theater had a dance hall in the basement known as the Lincoln Holiday. And um, President FDR used to host his birthday parties there. So that tells you the sense of the community that you could just be attending a normal cabaret or party and the President of the United States is hosting this party at the same place. That was what U Street was all about. People supported one another, people took care of one another, and you'll see a lot, read a lot of that, of course, in my book. I don't want to give too much of it away or too many spoilers, but the community was a special place. Um, people would send their kids to day camps, such as at the YMCA, which on U Street, another first. It was the first uh, YMCA for African American boys. They would go swimming there. Um, you had different schools, you had different uh, pools in the neighborhood, you had different events, and you'll read about all of them. You had Griffith Stadium, where it's uh, no longer there, but it was located where Howard University Hospital is today. And that was a place where people would gather. They would go to baseball games, they would watch the Negro uh, League play, which was um, the Homestead Braves. Actually, Duke Ellington worked at Griffith Stadium selling ice cream there as a kid, but that was the sense of community. Everybody knew everybody, and everybody supported everyone. Now, if you go to New Street today, which we are going to New Street within the quarter now, it is a little different. I do think that there is support and there is a lot of pride coming back, which is awesome. But the city itself, and especially the neighborhood of New Street, is heavily gentrified. And so this is a problem that we are seeing not just on New Street, but also in other cities and other places. But as you'll read in my book, D.C. statistically has the, make the largest and most major um, effect of gentrification in comparison to any other American city. Which when you hear that and you're in D.C., it's like, oh, really? Yes. And so I wrote this book to preserve the history. Um, the biggest part about knowing your history is so that you can be educated, and that way you can make an influence, you can make impact. And I think it's special to also tell and share the story. Like I mentioned at the start of this, the first person to share their history memories with me was my grandmother. And so it's so important not just to have written history, but also oral history. And so whether you're attending a talk like this, whether it's in your own household, take the time to learn more about the neighborhood that you're in. You want to always be aware and honor and pay homage to the past because one, it's inspiring, but two, especially as a person of color, it's a part of your heritage. And so I think it's
which is so important that we're educated, that we support black-owned businesses. There are still um, the three that I remain on U Street, and there are a lot of new ones as well, but this is how we keep our businesses from closing down and our, our churches and the things that make the community the community. And so that's pretty much my spiel. Um, a question I'll close with that I ask myself because I don't have a moderator, moderator today. <laughs> but people will ask me if U Street could talk, what would it say? And I always say this. I say U Street would say, tell my whole story. It's nice to talk about Black Broadway and the shining lights and the glory days, but let's talk about the entire picture of U Street. Let's talk about the, the beginning of history starting from slavery. But then let's talk about how even as slaves, people were finding themselves to be able to do small jobs here and there so that they could pay to free themselves and their family, like um, Aletha Tanner, who you'll read about in my book. And then we'll talk about Howard University and how that was a not just a place of education, but a place of community and a place of social socialization where people could really be who they want to be and create. And then we'll talk about also going into the Black Rama era, which is known as the New Negro Renaissance, where you have all of these elites and you have these big brains like Elaine Locke and Neville Thomas coming to make change right here on U Street. And then we do have to talk about the 1968 riots, right? Where MLK is assassinated and U Street is crushed. But after that, there's a revival, and we had Chocolate City, and in 1970, the census said that there is 70% black people, 70% of the population are black people in Washington, D.C. And we do have crime, and we do have violence, and we do have more destruction. But then we had Mary and Mary, and we had him make the race there, and he put a lot of wealth back into the community. And yes, now we're aiming with gentrification, but we have built a lot, we still have a lot, and there's still a lot more to do. So you sure can talk and say, tell my the story, and I'll add one other thing. Keep making history. That's it, and I hope you're by the book. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Ooh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think I'm just loud in general, so you got to get worse. It's okay. Hello, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Let's give another hand. <laughs> and so we're going to start the Q and A. But actually, I have a question for you. Okay. You speak a little bit about the just like the history of enslavement here in the district and how uh, I know like we're all taught like some slaves could buy their freedom, but that was something that actually did happen here in the district. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah. So um, that's actually referred to as manumission, and so slaves um, were able. Well, I don't say they were able because that was a little. The wrong term. They weren't really able. They made a way to where they would find small jobs. If you read in my book as well, especially when there were um, contraband camps, where at the time slaves weren't completely free, but they um, slaves that were literally running away from places in the South, they would come to DC and they would be held in these places called contraband camps, which were terrible, terrible conditions. I mean, it'd be equivalent to a 21st century slum. It was, it was really bad. And uh, they would have those small jobs to do. And so some of them, after their jobs, some people worked at the naval bases and things like that. They would note and make money for, uh, be able to save some money here and there. And so one of the uh, slaves specifically that I mentioned, Aletha um, Tanner, who was able to free herself, she went on to free, uh, I know at least 10 other slaves um, and actually, who helped her was she was running a garden, and who helped her was uh, Thomas Jefferson, actually. And so, I know, random, right? You'll read okay. <laughs> But, um, so that's how maybe mission worked. So you would have to get a job outside of your normal job, which was slavery, which you obviously were not paid for. And making this way, because I didn't, like I said, it wasn't able, but putting in this extra time by making a garden or selling a piece of clothing or things like that, you were able to buy yourself free. And this also took a level of um, somewhat of education as well, because of course we know for a long time it was illegal for black people to learn how to read. Um, even after um, those type of laws being passed, it was illegal for a black person to even print anything or own a, a publishing company because they were afraid of press getting out. And so that's kind 
kind of um, how it works. It wasn't something that you could just snap your fingers and do. But like I said earlier, black people, we are resilient and we've been really, really good at making very sweet lemonade out of super sour lemons. And so that's what we do. Not you talking, not you taking me back to Beyonce's lemonade. <laughs> And now we turn to the audience. Do y'all have any questions for Brianna today? Yes, I'm moving. We're moving. We're making our way downtown, walking fast. Let me stop before you two get to us. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, and I apologize for being late. Um, so I just started uh, a career in real estate, and my platform is generational wealth. And again, I apologize for being here late. I, uh, I will like the book, so I'll give you more of that history. I appreciate that. So um, I know that you mentioned some of the um, solutions would be to continue to make history. So as a person of color whose platform is generational wealth, how would you start or recommend um, those stepping stones or building blocks for someone who's like in their 30s trying to you know, make up um, away themselves um, financial stability and stuff like that um, to someone who would visual her family and stuff like that? Um, I would say the first thing is, uh, I'm not a financial coach, but I always say it's good to get out of debt. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the number one. Um, outside of just that knowledge of, of wanting to get out of that, I say too, find something that you're really passionate about and start making money off of it. I think if the pandemic taught um, people anything, especially the generation you're speaking to, is that you can do a lot with your hands. Like when you're not tied up in everything else, you know, your normal job, and I'm not saying don't quit your job. I'm saying get a side hustle and start making some money and putting it aside so that you can build that wealth. And the next thing, especially you spoke to real estate, and I did um, some talks a while ago with uh, some up and coming black owners, and they're just buying properties all throughout um, Southeast, and, which is amazing, right? And the first thing they said was like, black people have to get back to owning property. The reason why Big Chili Bowl is still there is because they own it. The reason why these flower car shop is still there is because they own it. And so that's what we is to don't just go somewhere and move in and rent, which is maybe a start, but that's how gentrification has happened, right? Um, the prices have gone up, the interest rates go up, and so even if you were there at some point, a lot of people were sold out or bought out, but when you own the space you're in, you have way more control because no one can just raise your rent. They might can raise some property taxes, but you still own the land, well, not the land, but the actual building and space. So that would be my advice. The end goal would be to own. Do we have any other? Yes. We're going. We're moving. We're grooving. We're doing. I love that question, by the way. So, here today, I just want to thank you for the free information you raised upon us. Oh, thanks for coming. <laughs> so, how long did it take to do all this research and put this book together? Yeah, so it began as a piece of Washingtonian magazine. I started researching it in 2016. Um, it published at the end of that year in print and it came out online in 2017. And then I signed my book deal a few years, a few months after that. So all in all, about five years worth of research in the area, um, just solely writing, it was a little over three years, which is not the original plan. So that's the other thing about deadlines, you know. Sometimes they happen, sometimes they don't. But I think the book came out perfect timing. Because otherwise, it would have came out right at the start of the pandemic. Oh, so I would know that. <laughs> Great. We have a question from the online audience. Hello. Yeah, right. What was the most surprising thing that you found in your research? Like, what really made you kind of go, Ooh. I always love that question. Okay, so one of the most surprising things, now this is more of a fun fact, which I always like to say because I just think it's, it's it was surprising when, when I was told it. Um, but uh, I interviewed Miss Virginia Ali, who's the owner of Bench to the Bowl and original founder of and um, she actually was telling me how she came to New Street. She moved to uh, D.C. from Tappahannock, Virginia, when I believe she was 21 years old. Um, she lived with her sister, and she actually got her start on New Street as a bank teller at Industrial Savings, which I always think is just the most interesting thing. Because we talk about being young and having your own money. Um, that was just the question. But like, just a few years later, down a few doors down, she would be owning a business that's still around today, but she started working at a bank. So everyone has to start somewhere. 
And I think I love that, especially as her being a woman and a woman of color, because a lot of opportunities, which you'll read in my book, were for women to be in the house as uh, domestic servants, and then eventually they were called daytime workers. And so this is, that was not the full question, but this is also surprising as well for me when I was researching, is that this is how a lot of the social clubs and book clubs and uh, societies were started, was because women found in a lot of clubs, once they went from being living servants, so living servant is what it sounds like. You literally live there, you were a maid, you cooked and cleaned, took care of the kids. But at some point with the Industrial Revolution, women were able to become day workers. So they would show up and have a full day of cooking, cleaning, taking care of the kids, but at the end of the day, they would go home, which was a pivotal turning point for women having their own because now they had free time. And what they did with that free time is they went to church, <laughs> they started clubs, they hung out with their girlfriends, and you know what we do when we get together, we start inviting more people. And before you knew it, you had societies and places like the Phyllis Weekly YWCA, which is still around and operating today. So those were the kind of things that were surprising to me, that everything just kind of started somewhere. Like you have this big, grand invention, but it started with people just living their normal, everyday lives. And then this question is for me. You mentioned a little bit about Thomas Jefferson. Have you ever thought about delving into just that entire just web with him and Sally Hemings? Well, I mean, I have. I've thought about a lot of different webs. <laughs> so I have. There's so much that's not in my book that I've researched and that um, had to edit out for the sake of pages and you're not reading, you know, 10 books in one. But I have thought about that. There's a lot of other cool facts and things that I've only had time to mention that I would love to know more about, but yeah. Um, do you have any, any other questions? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, Thank you again, this has been so inspiring to watch. I just love the passion that you're conveying and the fact that you wrote this story, so thank you. My question is, I would love to know, has writing this story inspired you in any way to better reflect on how we can better show up for our community, how we can better play an active role and better support the people so we can continue to make our community successful and preserve this legacy? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think like I always say, even showing up to events and talks and buying books like this, right, is a good way to show up because it's so important that we know our history because if we don't know it, I mean, who's going to tell it to us? That sounds blunt, but I meant what I said. <laughs> and um, I guess it's been very eye-opening. Um, so before I was even doing history, I was covering crime for the Afro-American newspaper. So I've always spent a lot of time writing um, African-American focused news. But of course, that was the negative side of it a lot. Um, and so this was a big switch for me to detail the history. And of course, you have to go through the negative parts of it, but also being able to highlight and show the positive side of it brings a totally different perspective in terms of inspiring and also being able to show up for us and show up for our, show up for our community. And my book actually ends um, in, with 20, in 2019 with the Dome UDC protest. And so that was a major win for black people, especially in DC and especially in Utrecht, because that's where it took place, uh, but showing up for each other and sticking together and saying, no, these are our grassroots, this is our music, this is special to us, this is our neighborhood, and we welcome you here, but you're not going to push us out at the same time. And because of that, we actually got legislation that we were able to finally say that go go music is the actual um, music of DC. That's like written now in law legislation, but that came from. Any more questions from that? Yes. And then we have one more from the live stream as well. And then we'll take a little temperature check and then see. Uh, hello. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, I'm just so fascinated by kind of when you brought it out to these kind of big national, big picture things. 
Um, and I moved to DC like two years ago, and I, you know, fell in love. And I'm so, um, it's still so much history to learn. So I really appreciate that. First of all, when you're talking to people who aren't, I, mean, I assume y'all live here, perhaps, or live around the area, right? And so we're invested. We're interested. What is kind of your pitch about why this seemingly, you know, niche history? What what can it teach people who are not living in DC and who are not, you know, part of the neighborhood, but who want to learn more about, you know, the importance of Black Mecca or Black Broadway? I've heard Black Mecca, but I've never heard Black Broadway, right? And so, um, what's kind of your message like to others who are not part of DC about, like, why you wrote this book and what it might mean to others? Yeah, great question. Um, my message would be that a lot of things that took place on U Street. Um, were first for the nation. So I mentioned like the first high school in the nation to admit black students was right here on U Street. Um, I mentioned the creator of the blood bank. I didn't mention uh, Madame Lily and Avanti, who you can also see her house um, is still there today, um, who was the first uh, international opera singer of color. Um, so there are a lot of things that happen on U Street, whether it was entertainment, whether it was uh, property wise, or whether it was legislation that made an impact everywhere. So I mentioned like Thurgood Marshall, for instance, who grew up in Baltimore, he was born in 1908, but he traveled uh, six days out the week to attend Howard University Law School because even in his hometown, University of Maryland, College Park, and I actually went there for uh, graduate school, so no shade to him, but they wouldn't admit him. They weren't letting black students in. So he had to go. He didn't like just choose, oh, I love Howard. No, he had no other choice but to go to Howard University Law School. And because of that, and him running into Charles Hamilton Houston, he helped win the case for desegregation nationally. And so that's always my pitch, is like, U Street, although it's such a small area, it's always had such a national impact, even with the WDC protest, that was national news when it was happening, and the bubbles were happening, and the rallies. And so that's what has made, that's what made U Street special. It's just like when you hear Broadway, you think of, oh, these are the greatest acts in America. It was the same uh, Black Broadway. It really made a difference um, nationally. It still does. I mean, our vice president, you know, she's a Howard University grad. So another first, even in 2021. Don't remind the Cappers. Don't do it. <laughs> All right. Do you have any more questions? Or are we going to finish up with the last one? Yeah. All right. So the last question um, comes from a teenager who's watching, which is funny. Um, they wanted to know what kind of advice that you have to give to young folks who are looking to do this kind of work. It sounds like um, you started in the Washingtonian, so you had that passion, and that's what really drove you. What advice do you have for other local, like you know, history buffs, journalists in the making? Yeah. So I love questions like that because. I'm so young, um, I'm nearly 28 years old, so I know I'm not as young as when I started, but still fairly young to be telling anybody's history. Um, and my advice is just to stick with it. Like whatever it is that you want to do, when I first started writing this or even wanted to write a book, it's like, you're gonna do what? And you are how old? <laughs> you didn't live through any of this? How are you gonna tell this history? Um, like I mentioned, I was covering crime at the time. So I think my advice of being young, um, in whether it's journalism or history or research or, I don't know, owning a business or doing hair, it could be anything. Um, my biggest thing for young people, I always tell them, just don't quit. Like, you might be the only person in the world that cares about what you're doing, and that's fine. And specifically, I don't know um, whether I'm speaking to um, someone of color or a woman or anything like that, but the other thing is, too, it's okay to um, put yourself out there. I think with publishing this book, I wasn't even on social media before this. I did always show up to different things. I've always been a hard worker. But it's also okay to put whatever you're working on once you're ready, put it out to the world. It's okay to show up and network as well, meet new people. And a bit of advice that I like to give to people of color, especially young people and um, women, young girls as well, is like, if you are the only person of color in the room, that's okay. That's okay too. I was in a lot of rooms and it was nobody that looked like me, but I still had to show up. And because of that, I look back at places I used to work and I'm like, wow, things have changed, which is awesome. And the other thing is too, it's okay to not, um, it's okay to make friends that don't look like you. That's what made you special. 
special. It was so diverse. Everybody welcomed everybody. And sometimes as black people, we can get so insulated and just go into what's comfortable and natural. But it's also okay to work with everybody. Um, the writer of my epilogue is uh, Dr. D Dr. Dumcha, who is the historian of Vince Chili Bowl. And he is a white man. And so if you see us in a book talk together, we look crazy, right? And he's much older than me. I'm young. I'm a black woman. But together, we make a really good team because we are interested in the same thing. So that's my, my, my long spill of advice is one, go quick, and also get around people that have the same interests of you, no matter what their actual background is. Just awesome. And we actually have one last question. Okay. One last one. Hey, y'all. Hi. Y'all can hear me? Well, my name is Dr. Lane. I'm the server. I'm actually an entrepreneur, and the end of it kind of hit me because I'm going up and down now. It's like everybody's doing what I'm doing. Um, I get discouraged a lot of the times. I would say your marketing and you been, like you said, young. How did you push through that and any advice you have for me? Yeah, um, to you saying that everybody is doing what you're doing. Nobody can do what you want to do how you do it. Only you can be you, right? And so I think with social media, um, a lot of times we start to make products that look like what everybody else is doing when you have something uniquely special to you. So a lot of people have, well, I won't say a lot, but people have told the history of you street before. People have told the black history of you street before and they've even written about it. But the way that I told it, is going to be different than how somebody else tells it. And so I think that that would be just if you're struggling, the first kind of thing is a mindset change and like, actually no one is doing what I'm doing because what I'm doing is unique to, to me and my product, whatever it is that you're um, working on. And the other thing is with marketing and um, things like that, I just use social media. So my, my awesome twin brother, which I didn't mention, that's my twin, actual twin, um, <laughs> He actually does graphic design and work, so he does a lot of my flyers, and he was on social media way before me. And so that's the thing of like being around a community that's like-minded. I literally hated social media. To this day, I'm still like, oh my goodness, I have to post something. But that's the way of the world when it comes to marketing. So I say just do as much as you're comfortable with. If you don't like showing your face, that's fine. Show your product, right? You know, you don't have to be in the front of everything. Show what you actually are trying to sell. And don't be so caught up in like they got a thousand likes. You might have twenty likes, but all twenty people are buying it. So that's yeah, my deal. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for asking. And before we wrap up, you want to tell us about that little walkthrough? Yes, I do. Thank you. Because Katie will be like, ah! I know. <laughs> walking tours and so we're doing our final installment next saturday october 16th at 3 p.m and it is an actual physical walking tour view street the tours usually run between about an hour and a half and two hours long we've done two already and the very last one is going to feature the writers and educators of the black broadway area and we're actually going to end right there bus boys and poets so we can have food and drinks together and talk about what we just saw so if you want to sign up for that go to offftm.com You'll see where you can purchase tickets, and yeah, it's gonna be a great time. Awesome! Thank you so much, Brianna. Thank you. Let's go ahead and give her a round of applause. I got it this time. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you to everybody joining us virtually on our live stream. We are going to be selling the books later in a few minutes now, and there will be your design them. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you all so much. Don't forget to say thank you to our server, our lovely visionary. Yes. And all right. Get home safe. Peace and love, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.